Tenakoto Car Tour. Oh. <laughs> this is the very last Gone by Lunchtime of the year 2023. It's a pleasure to be here in the studio with the Dasher and Prancer of New Zealand Podcasting. Oh my God, can I be Prancer? The mall centres of New Zealand political commentary. Annabelle Lee Matha, kia ora. Kia ora. Ben Thomas, kia ora. Is that because we bully Tim Watkin, the Rudolph of New Zealand political <laughs> podcasting? Um, it's the morning of December 19, and that means that our commentary today will not take in the events of December 20, which is a very unlikely date in the calendar to be such a busy one in New Zealand politics. What's you wouldn't have picked then? it. Well, there's the haifu, of course, which looks like you. There's the, oh, yeah. the mini micro nano budget uh, being Starting presented to by feel Nicola a lot Willis. Like haifu. That's right. Yeah. And um, Christopher Luxon is going to Australia. Although, who knows how? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, like, maybe you can take him into Islander. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, uh, because the um, 757s, which he. Has been, you know, he's been proved right that they're not really in fit state, both out of action. There's another one that he might take, some other Boeing kind of uh, survey plane. Can Maybe John Key just fly him over in the chopper? Yeah, that would be cool. Or Richie McCaw. Yeah. Well, they could take turns because you probably you probably can't get to Australia on one helicopter. He could just go. He S- could send the Navy along with a support boat. <laughs> He will fly. Anyway, so our commentary can't take in all of that, including whether if he flies on a, in a jet pack across the Tasman. That'd be cool. Just doing fuckatoki the whole way. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so with, 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 with that caveat, we will um, wrap up the year as best we can in short time because everyone's busy. Everyone's got shopping to do um, and loose ends to tie up. It's <sighs> been three weeks, just three weeks since the government was sworn in, um, and they've been busy. It's not always been smooth. What a time. But it's been really busy. Um, Parliament's been under urgency. The parties of all three parties, this first ever three-party coalition, full coalition, have all had various wins to boast. A lot of control Z, or if you prefer, control Z, and some of those things which I've written down here. Reserve bank remit reverted, fair pay agreements gone, clean car rebate gone, 90 day trial restored for all businesses. We're underway with the repeal of RMA replacement bills. Inter Island ferry project sunk. Let's get Wellington moving scrapped. And there are probably others. Just oh, and, uh, the I just heard on the, on the radio on the way in here, they're scrapping the tax reporting principles. Yeah. Bill. God, I'm going to miss that. It was. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, the let's, Taxation <laughs> Principles Reporting Act repeal bill. And I thought that's getting in quite early, isn't it? Revenue Minister Simon Watts. Re- Simon Watts is the, the, just is, back from Dubai. From um, when when you are saving the climate. If, if you're a new inmate in a prison, you go into the room, you find the biggest person, and you walk up and you punch them in the nose, and that is what Simon Watts has done to an obscure piece of tax legislation in yeah. his first weeks as Revenue Minister. Do you think they had like they got that biscuit tin and everyone? You know the one that's used for members' bills and to see who gets their repeal bill because everyone's got like five repeal bills <laughs> they're getting worked on. Or maybe that was one that got drafted quite quickly. Who knows? What's the story, Annabelle, of this coalition so far? Because a lot of that, obviously, so far they're, 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 there's a mandate for what's happening. There's they have a, the, the, un, you know get get back on track, get New Zealand back on track, repeal lots of this legislation. That was what was. Um, Pledge during the campaign, but it's kind of get back to where. And I'm try- I, when I think about the the coalition government, the national pitch I think is get back to where Jonky left off. Jonky and Bill English left off. It's like let's pick up where they left off and then get rid of this this um, aberration. Uh, the the ACT Party is get back to 1991 and the Ruth Richardson budget. Mm. And then New Zealand First is get back to I don't know, sometime in the nineteen fifties, I guess. Yeah. That's is that is that what you know so what do you think, Annabelle? Uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff they don't really have a mandate for because they didn't campaign on it. Like the smoking legislation is No, a, not the smoking, but these uh, repeal is stuff. Is a did. classic example. Like there's stuff that people weren't really that that weren't well discussed in their during the election campaign 
that's now cropped up. My little sister came home from Australia last night where she's been working mm. um, for the last year, and she was like, sis, what's happening with Te Reo Māori? And I started telling her about it. And um, and the more I explained about the different policies that were coming in, she was literally incredulous. She just couldn't believe the stuff that was being proposed. And then I topped it off with the and, but wait, there's more um, pseudo ephedrine oh. is um, coming back. And it, it's interesting because I think so, over you know, the, picks and troughs, picks and troughs, <laughs> like, <laughs> totally <laughs> worth it. Totally <laughs> worth it. At least while you're watching <laughs> totally the worth progress the of the Murray being marched back, yeah. you won't have snot running down exactly. your chin. Exactly. But it, it was interesting for me to watch her response because I think we've become acclimatised to some of the really bizarre policies that, you know, are being implemented. Um, and so to see it through fresh eyes and her reaction to yeah. it for me was really telling. And I think I I think that the – I can't help but think that the public will run out of patience with, with some of this stuff because at the end of the day, none of these are feel-good Policies that are really going to make an impact on everyday New Zealanders. It might scratch a little itch of resentment that you may be feeling in the short term because there's a cost of living crisis and everyone had a hard time during COVID. But I don't think there's going to be any lasting afterglow. What's next from from, from the policies hmm. that have been that have been pushed through? And then I think things are going to become difficult. Ben, well, I think, in a way, I think that's right. By definition repealing laws that have never come into effect isn't going to make a noticeable difference in people's lives, right? Um, you're, you're just resetting to the baseline. And that's, so that's three waters, you know, billions of dollars have been spent, but nothing's actually happened, you know, that has changed anyone's experience of turning on the tap and having either pristine, beautiful water or mind controlling fluoride or brown gunk come out, you know, whatever the case is, that's all handled elsewhere. Uh, the RMA reform, same thing. Six years in the six years in the making. Uh, you know, five minutes in the in the beginning. Um, the fair pay agreements, same thing. You know, I don't know if I, I think there might have been a couple of stop work meetings to discuss the potential of fair pay agreements right about the time just before they were sort of um, crossed out in red crayon from the uh, consolidated statute books held in law libraries. So. Uh, yeah, uh, look, I think you're right. People won't notice that much of a difference. And, and if things don't pick up in the economy, people will start to notice that in the same way that, you know, Chris Hipkins promised a new dawn, you know, going back to the beginning of the year, um, our Dune exited stage left, um, Hipkins, Hipkins said, we're going to be laser like focused on the cost of living. Four months later, during the budget, you know, people got their $5 prescription and charges waived yeah. or whatever. And, you know, d despite what you might hear online, that actually didn't sort of make the people rise up in happiness and sort of, you know, solve all their problems. You know, cost of living crises are actually very hard for governments to address, you know, because if you look at, you know, if you look at the mad scramble <laughs> for money to pay for these tax cuts right now, yeah. you know, and the tax cuts are not significant. <laughs> no. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of, they're not, they're but not they've, trivial, but, but you know. But I, I, they've become mission critical as far uh, as the promise of the new government is we, concerned. We, we, we what was, percentage, we, what I'm interested, well, I, sorry to interrupt you, Ben, but what percentage of New Zealanders are, are landlords that are going to get the tax cuts? Like, is it a huge percentage of people? Like, why are they? I don't understand why they're so focused on getting these tax cuts to landlords. Well, it's puzzling that it's been pushed forward by that was a net concession that Act got. And I think that does go to another way of looking at it in terms of what we've seen first up, which is the bases, the core constituencies mm. of each of the parties have been. Uh, been been had their demands delivered. So yes. for for businesses, you've had fair pay agreements pushed back. You know, for rural areas, the three waters stuff. For landlords, 
guys, it's Christmas. <laughs> Christmas is coming early um, for people who are Christmas upset. is coming early. For it's people, time to kick out people, those orphans. People yeah. who are upset <laughs> about, <laughs> about Te Reo. Yeah. You know, look, we've yeah. already done it. Te Waka Kotahi has, has been subordinate, you know. But then the question is what, and I guess that's what comes out of the idea of these border tax cuts, is that even though they don't kick in for some time, they will be delivered as of tomorrow in, in, in the mm. mini budget. There'll be, there'll be a, a stake in the ground. And keepers, the and keepers of New Zealand, you kick that family into the major. <laughs> the, um, uh, yeah, and, and you saw, you know, I mean, I, I don't like these Trump comparisons, but this, you know, you, you can't just yeah you can't just be on the attack or against things all the time. You, or you can, as Trump showed, if if the economy is improving and if people are feeling better about themselves. So you know there is a big bet happening right now. The Reserve Bank will get inflation under control. The recession won't be too bad or will only affect Labor voters. And uh, you know and and the base will sort of be satisfied and think yeah things are actually getting better and that will actually ease everything else. Like you said, you know. Uh, t- treaty complaints and grumbles get much worse when people feel like they're going backwards and you know <clears throat> and 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 get told these stories about special privileges or whatever um so yeah look it's it's a bet that you know is, is more likely to pay off than not in the sense that you know the indicators seem to be going the right way um but you know yeah it, it is hard you you're not going to make people more than momentarily happy by repealing stuff that only really existed in the abstract for them anyway let's uh rattle through the parties that are in parliament with a quick assessment um against the clock on how they've performed in the year 2023 starting from the smallest to the largest in parliament to party maori who have had a had a very visible and by many accounts um, successful start to a term with a larger caucus. How many have they got? Six MPs now? Performed, outperformed expectations, Annabelle, mostly by really focusing well on those um, Māori electorates um, and doing better than many of us expected. Oddly enough, Mika Whaiteri was the one who missed out. Um, What's your assessment of Te Pāti Māori in 2023? I I think you're right, like a a, a meteoric performance by Te Pāti Māori. Their one misstep being the the Mika Whaiteri um, uh, decision to run her in Ikaroa Rāwhiti. I think they're going to have a sublime three years because this government is just like delivering so much content, literally content for them to um, to use um, to motivate their their young uh, voters. And you know they've they've show, they've demonstrated um, how quickly they can organise you know nationwide um, activations as they called them. And so I think you know they're they're going to have a great three years, and they're going to have an epic election in um, in twenty twenty six, in my opinion. And, and for them, it, like there's no responsibility; they've got no portfolios to worry about or anything like that. They can just sit on the cross benches, um, launching grenades. And uh, I think um, that this government hasn't been very strategic in terms of drawing Te Pāti mm. Māori closer to them. Do you think, Ben, sometimes uh, the media are uh, a bit easygoing on Te Pāti Māori in terms of yes, some of the of course. hyperbole and some of the yes. uh, inconsistency? And uh, yeah, of course. I mean, the, 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 I mean every, everything from the sort of trivialities, you know, Rāwari Waititi sort of claiming that wearing Jordans in the house is a crucial part of his tikanga and culture. Uh, and then, the, you know, the much more incendiary comments recently about, um, you know, reverting smoking laws to the status quo is a genocide. Um, you know, of, of course, and, you know, f- frankly, ridiculous policies about, you know, supporting the Russian invasion of Ukraine on the basis that, you know, the Ukraine were colonized, the Ukrainians were colonizers or something like that. Annabelle is just, right, though, like, that the circumstances are perfect for a protest party representing a particular generation 100%. of Te Ao Māori. 
hundred percent, not just Tao Māori, they'll be bringing heaps yeah. of little white kids off Instagram um, who are just, who are ripe for wanting to get out and protest and take pictures and, you know, and, and feel like a real kind of burning desire to speak out about social justice issues, yep. you know, that are close to them, that are homegrown. Um, I think we we have a sort of, I think, the New Zealand music revival of the mid-2000s, but for activisms uh, this, this three years. New Zealand first, Annabelle. Um, Mata Winston Peters, Shane Jones, uh, and assorted others <laughs> uh, have already impressed themselves upon the public imagination by, we talk about the Party Māori being party of protest in, in, in its own way. New Zealand First is a party of opposition. It just needs something to oppose, you know, and Christopher Luxon will be hoping that for as long as possible it's not the National Party and started off being the media and it will, you know, find its other sort of sources of heat through which to <laughs> be visible. Um, what do you make of New Zealand First so far? Um, well, there's... I really don't know where to start with New Zealand First. There's so much to say, but one of the things that I've been ref- reflecting on recently is Winston Peters' relationship with Te Reo Māori. As we know, he's pushing to um, to make English an official language of New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he should he'll be delighted when he finds out that it actually already is. So <laughs> that's a little Christmas present, early Christmas present for him. But you know, I can't. Uh, I'm sure that Winston Peters would hate to hear me saying this, but I, I actually think that Winston Peters' issues with Te Reo Māori are, are based in real trauma. I think that Winston Peters is a man who is used to feeling like the smartest person in the room who can go into any crowd or or place and, and dominate and always be you know, feel very articulate and smart and all of those things. And I think being in a real Māori setting makes him feel incredibly inadequate because in those settings, he is not the smartest person in the room. He is, you know, uh, he, he is not able to hold himself in the way someone like Rawiri Waititi could or Calvin Davis could by virtue of the fact that they are um, real speakers. And so it seems to me that perhaps, well, more than likely, that's a lot of what his resentment about te reo Māori is. And, he probably, and I think that, you know, he recognises that for older New Zealanders... Um, learning a language or becoming accustomed to a new language can be a difficult thing by virtue of the fact that it's hard for any of us to learn anything well, as, we, as we're older. Told, and told he's, 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 he's been learning for two tough. years. It's really hard. He's, 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 the, same as, he's hard the same as, as me as mm, Scotty Morrison's Māori Made Easy. Yeah. Good Actually, on maybe him for trying, though. We'll, yeah. uh, we'll do it on the Zoom. Mm. Good on him for we'll, trying. We'll and I think that taxpayers should pay for politicians to, for for political leaders to upskill their their um, ideal because it is an official language of the country and frankly Luxon grew up at a time when there wasn't free ideal when te reo Māori wasn't being taught in schools. It's never too late to learn, to learn te reo Māori in my view someone in his position should be supported to learn it so I don't actually have a problem with it at all but those are some of my thoughts about um, New Zealand First's strange relationship with Te Reo Māori. And I thought, you know, refusing to answer the question in Parliament the other day, or initially refusing to answer it, and then Jerry Brownlee following up and saying that, you know, it was up to him, you know, is incredibly disappointing for for um, Reo Māori speakers and Reo Māori advocates. Ben, New Zealand First started this year with a lot of us very doubtful at best about the prospect of returning. Did it again. Pulled it off again, as I think mm. maybe <laughs> maybe it was a clear or someone reporting that, you know, even Jesus only rose once. You know, there is this. It's... <laughs> You gotta, you gotta, you gotta hand it, don't you? You, you gotta hand it to Winston Peters because you, he will demand it as a condition of coalition government. <laughs> um, I, yeah, look, I don't know. I, I'm on record. I don't think New Zealand First are good for New Zealand. I don't think they're good for New Zealand. I don't think they're good for New Zealand politics. Um, I, but yeah, there, there seem. 
it wasn't just the way that he, that he came back, right? It's the way that he came back, which is so staggering, which was this, <laughs> this man who was deputy prime minister <laughs> during the lockdown, <laughs> the beginning of the pandemic, who spent much of the 2020 um, uh, campaign, you know, holding meetings outdoors, socially distanced. And there's some great footage online of Peter's in great form, absolutely excoriating a pandemic sort of believer at one of his, his meetings saying, you've come to the wrong meeting, pal. You know, you can leave right now, you know. And then, but he rose again, recast as the hero of the anti-vax, anti-mandate, anti-big government, anti-establishment. And it's just... It's like I I don't know like is he it's 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 like the men in black memory eraser or something you know he just like uh, every every 6 years or so he he just he can just reset um and it's, it's weird, isn't it? The, the community that does a lot of their own research weren't able to <laughs> we're identify. Able to, we're able to pick that, see that guy, that picture of that guy? That's also that guy. Yeah, he was like, we're going to have an inquiry to find out about the decision making behind the pandemic. And it's like, have you checked your email archive? Like, done some words. It's interesting. Just interesting the, Gmail. He like, was on the radio this morning. He's, you know, in his role as foreign minister, he's in the Pacific at, at PIF, for the PIF side meeting. And he's just, it's another guy. Yeah. There he is again. And he's sort of, talking uh, insightfully about the challenges in the Pacific region and mm. New Zealand's responsibility to its neighbours and stuff. And so it's a different guy. While at the same time gleefully announcing how they're going to return to, you know, drilling and oil and all of that stuff that is the, the, the single biggest threat to the Pacific, you know, in terms of it, it, um, what, with, without, rising, yeah. rising oceans, he's like right there behind everything that's going to warm us up. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty ecumenical on, you know, the kind of policy stuff, but but it was interesting hearing him on Morning Report, you know, talking about the threat of climate change <laughs> to the Pacific <laughs> Nations. And then, you know, in the, I think the only time climate change is even mentioned in the um, coalition agreements at all is New Zealand first saying, you know, uh, climate change policy won't be used to unduly stop um, economic yeah. growth. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and not to mention Shane Jones's um, speech in the House the other day. Oh, just yeah. absolutely be ripping into drilling Kiwis. In these climate extremists yeah. and so on. Moving on, Ben, the ACT Party, uh, an incredible story to have come from such a low in 2017, growing in 2020, continued to grow through towards 2023. Then you'll find, you'll find they established a lot of momentum during the 2017 campaign. Yes, yes, that's, yeah. that's right. <laughs> when you, you, do you, would you really like, you really <laughs> want to declare again that you were involved in that campaign? Okay. <laughs> oh dear. Um, but but then, it, then, it, then it sort of, it, it ebbed in the election year, yeah. um, in part because of New Zealand First's growth, in part because National restored a sense of itself as being a uh, Proper party of opposition, party in government and waiting, blah blah blah. What 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 do you? What is your? How do you mark act at the end of twenty twenty three? I mean, act had done everything right. You know, in the preceding you know, in three years ish leading up to the election, you know, new caucus, nine new MPs uh, had been predicted to be a disaster. You know, act in the past has brought in some real oddballs on the list, just like a lot of minor parties have. Um, they were extremely organised. They had extremely good pastoral care. Um, you wrote a fantastic story about the Renaissance of Act um, for the spin-off, which, you know, it talked about things like the, the kind of panopticon office. All of the MPs were in there together with all their staff. So everyone knew what everyone was doing at every point and everyone was there to help each other. Um, and it meant that... Like the, a all, commune. Yeah, yeah, all, that was like nanny stay mm, like all the these, brothers watching all the time. It was a vo- vo- voluntary contract. So the when you... And, and so you had you know, there's people like Karen Chow, you know, never been involved in politics before, um, you know, who became and, and were, you know, really gradually led into being sort of public figures. So it wasn't the sort of case, same with, you know, which Winston Peters has where, you know, if you're a new MP for New Zealand First, you're just there to make up numbers. You're just there to be in the room, vote the right way. Uh, it was, you know, it was it was very genuinely bringing these people up, figuring out who was a good spokesperson. In the end, he had half a dozen really good people. They successfully managed out the ones that they didn't think had much of a future. They all left without a fuss, reasonably happy with their lot, brought in new talent at the, you know, on the list. 
everything was going great. There was one Roy Morgan rogue poll, you know, ridiculous poll, but it had them at 17% national at about 25 or something like that. And it... it I, I, and it's hard to isolate what went wrong. I think that, you know, obviously Nationals' resurgence, I think, played some part in it. But I, I think it was really it was really that kind of week, the, t- the turning point where everything came to a head was where Seymour talked about confidence but not supply. Um, and then, then suddenly the idea of uncertainty crept into the idea of ACT, which had previously been seen as just sort of a rock-solid cornerstone. Seymour probably got a little bit arrogant, I think, during the campaign. Um, but then, you know, Winston Peters was on the rise at that point. And I suspect that the confidence but not supply thing, it rocked Act's, Act's vote. It caused a lot of distraction. And I think that Seymour lost a bit of confidence at that point and decided, you know, he had to play it straight, you know, the same way as the, you know, the All Blacks kind of keeping the ball tight, just going up the middle, not wanting to throw it around, not wanting to risk the gains that they had made. Yeah. But I think that took away a lot of what pe- what really appealed to people about Seymour and ACT. Um, and, and, you know, I think we saw that with a sort of gradual kind of decline into election day. And about your reflections on the ACT party in 2023? One of the things that I've found interesting is the just the change in Seymour's demeanour. Like, I think back to the referendum on the end of life bill and how even though, like, it's a bill where the stakes literally could not be higher, um, there was, in a funny way, kind of a unifying nature to that to that referendum, you know, it transcended, even though it actually doesn't, it transcended class and ethnicity and all of those things because it, it's something that most people have experienced in their lifetime watching, you know, someone very close to them experience pain before death or all of those things. And during those times, Seymour, I think, took a more mild approach in the way he communicated and sort of almost had a sort of statesman kind of feel to him in the way he communicated. And he used to be a bit more like that around Māori issues as well. Like, obviously, even though his colours are very much nailed to the mast, um, he didn't use inflammatory language or anything like that, or not very often anyway, but I've really noticed over the course of the election how much that has changed and how much more overt and aggressive his approach is to discussing issues around the treaty, ethnicity and all of that sort of stuff. And I mean, even this morning he's he's posted about the MAPAS program, you know, designed to, um, to uh, make sure that our medical schools reflect the makeup of our population <coughs> by ensuring that we have Māori and Pacifica doctors, as well as disabled people and a whole range of, you know, different types of New Zealanders. And he's talking about how it's, you know, racist and why do we accept this racism in our country. And, yeah, that for me, that's been one of the things that has really stood out, watching um, the, the language and the way that ACT communicates change. And I feel like it's really emboldened racists on the on social media and the internet and actually just out in the ordinary world where we're seeing people feel like they can just say overtly racist comments to people. So that's one of the the things I've been reflecting on. What about the Greens? The Greens, um, I think, have their biggest caucus ever now as well. I mean, yep, just... Uh, they have had campaigns in recent times that have, in one way or another, become, if not derailed, um, <laughs> quite close to it. They seem to run an incredibly effective campaign to me this time. Maybe the stakes weren't that high because they kind of must have known (laughs) that the chances of ending up in government were relatively low. But they put their stakes in the ground quite early in the year, released their policy relatively ahead of time, and were just a pretty organised machine. Mm. I feel like what their strength has been is that they haven't played it safe. Um, they, 
you know, have been really outspoken on the issues that matter to them. They haven't tried to position themselves as just a potential coalition partner to Labour. They've, they've um, you know, attempted to hold Labour to account. I feel like Marama and um, James Shaw performed incredibly well during the election campaign and that the two of them, you know, for all the stuff that James went through, you know, just not that long ago. Last year with a, the epic, yeah. yeah, and it feels like the two of them are, are very strong equals in their their strengths and their ability mm. to speak mm. across a, a range of people. They brought in some fantastic candidates. Um, you know, Tamitha Paul is a remarkable young wahine, um, um, Huhana Linden as well, and others. And, yeah, I think... I think they they did a really good job during the election. And to win to win to win three electorates is impressive. Just as for ACT to win two, you know, it's it's kind of putting down again some sort of it's, it makes it harder to fell the tree when there are roots in there. Ben, and is, that what can I just say that they wouldn't have won those seats if mm. they had listened to what every commentator, right wing commentator in New Zealand, has been trying to tell them to do for years, which is to create a. Um, you know, uh, what do you call it, a, a teal party and to reach out to National. I mean, as you've said, they've worked well with National in the past in terms of being able to get certain policies up. But had they had listened to that terrible, destructive advice, there's no way they would have won just one well, three electorates. Well, on that though, Ben, is it not true that for though we might praise their achievements and the quality of their campaign, a large part of their success is down to... Labor's vote collapsing, and yep. that's just the way it goes, you know. Yeah, it's reflexive, and they were in you know right place, right time to pick up that support. Um, the uh, it did really well in the electorates, which I think is more of a kind of weather vane, which I think you know it's a symbol of probably where unfortunately our public service is at. That you know the only parts of the country that really veer left. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, mean, it's, well, it's I actually Wellington. think that's an unfair assessment, Toad, because I think that they haven't just taken Labor's support. I think that actually when you go and you drill into the electorates like Mount Albert and you see how low the voter turnout was, actually Labor's a lot of Labor supporters literally just didn't bother showing up at the polls. And but, but same thing for the Greens, right? The Greens were polling at fifteen percent, you know, even in the weeks, yeah, you thirteen know, percent in the weeks leading up to the election, thirteen, fifteen, whatever. But they, you know, um, so you know, as per usual, they sort of underperformed on the day. Let's um, keep moving because time's against us. The Labor Party was the only one of the parties that are in Parliament to, to, to lose, to go, to go down, I think. You know, every, everyone else, all the other parties have gained and Labor lost quite a lot. <laughs> Labor, Labor, let's remember, won a historic single-party majority under MMP in 2020. Some stuff happened after that, you know. Let's not let's not um, overlook that. It was a very difficult term, but none of that can satisfactorily explain such a collapse, can it, Ben? And maybe you can give us your thoughts on whether or not had Jacinda Ardern decided she did have enough in the tank. It might have give us your give us your counterfactual. Could 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 they have done better? Could they even have won? I think if Ardern had stayed on, on, you would sort of be in a position where you would expect that Labor were going to lose all the way through, and she would shepherd them through to a slightly closer loss than they had. I think um, it's hard to see um, Ardern's Labor Party going under thirty. Um, you know, I, th- I think that she would have had sort of the, the, the pull and the, the loyalty of enough of her voters to at least sort of maintain that level of support, albeit, you know, they would already taken, you know, big hits in popularity. Um, you know, look, but, you know, you say you say that Labour were the only losers on election night, but 
an election night, you know, Chris Hipkins took to the stage, very graciously conceded, and then told everyone that he got laid. So, well, yeah, you know, was, another good, good news story from John, Christopher Luxon's New Zealand. <laughs> you know, Cred- it was that credits moment, roll, you know. That, that moment of, on letters election from, night. Letters, from, letters, from, letters to Cleo starts playing in the background. <laughs> Everybody at the Labour Party conference starts dancing, you know. Like, it's an incredible, I mean, incredible <laughs> inaction of the dead cat. It's, it's theory, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cr- create ambiguity about about whether my new lover is a man or a woman. Incredible, incredible move I, by look, Chris I, Hipkins. The thing is, you know, everybody won apart from all the other members of Labour who weren't Chris Hipkins. But otherwise, a great year for New Zealand. Um, and about Labour Party, I mean, scandal after scandal, minister after minister departing in uh, fog of scandal or um, in the next case of McAfee confusion, um, blindsiding. What, 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 how do you sum up that year for like, the Labour Party? I don't know. I want to go back a little bit further than that and just say that, you know, there's been so much criticism of how the Labour government handled COVID and in particular that last lockdown in Auckland. And, and what I want to say about that is that That was one of the rare examples of a government doing the right thing, even though it wasn't the popular thing to do. That that those difficult decisions that they made during that time, incredibly unpopular with the hospo people, as RNZ reminded us daily and all of those things, those decisions literally saved thousands of lives of Māori and Pacifica people thousands of lives. It's something they should be incredibly proud of. Aotearoa would look very different today if they hadn't have made those decisions. Whakapapa was saved, whānau was saved. I, I think it was truly their greatest moment and I'll forever be grateful for those decisions that they made that kept whānau safe. I think one of the places where they've gone wrong is they want to distance themselves from covid And in doing so, they've created a vacuum that's been filled up by other people. So I think, you know, they actually should have leaned back into their their, um, COVID narrative because it's been completely rewritten. And, you know, we literally are the envy of the world for how we performed. So I just want to acknowledge that side of Labour's term. And then on the flip side... What an absolute shit show. Like, you could not have had a better setup in 2020 to really push some incredible intergenerational change that would benefit New Zealanders. And they absolutely squandered it and frankly became very arrogant as a government, which I think we saw through the collapse of the various ministers getting booted out for bad behaviour. So the, it, the funny thing was none of them seemed to learn a lesson. You know, I think we've already talked about on election night, you know, Stuart Nash and Kerry Allen, fresh from the ministerial dump, dump site, were, you know, lecturing their colleagues about how they could have done better to win the election. Exactly. <laughs> you know? I mean, I was <laughs> flabbergasted by some of the commentary. But, um, and then Hipkins the other day gives an interview and says, we're not going to allow the election loss to push us to the left. You know, we're going to remain firmly in the centre. And it's like, I'm just, wow, you know, he's... Uh, it seems like Labor just do not have enough self-reflection yet to understand what went so terribly wrong for them. We'll get into more of that next year. Very quickly, a word on national. They won. They won in a way that they had predicted was not going to be the best style of victory. In a word, National Party 2023, Ben Thomas. Uh, they were like a person carrying a large uh, stack of boxes from one end of a room to another and it started teetering and teetering and eventually they fell over the line with them. Um, uh, you know, I, th- I think they made a lot of problems for themselves that they didn't need from early on in Luxon's leadership, you know, guaranteeing the tax cuts, which have, you know, probably didn't actually win them that many votes in the end and, and uh, have you know, been a real sort of um, millstone around the neck in terms of trying to get the uh, micro, mini, nano budget um, to balance. Um, So, yeah, look, you know, all credit, you can't, you know, all hail to the champ. Um, 
you know, Luxon's the Prime Minister, which means, you know, he, he was the winner politically of this year. Um, and, uh, yeah. It's all... And he pulled the party up from its own state of distress oh, for sure. and yeah, yeah, dysfunction, yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, which I think... Oh, look, I, I think he did a very good job. Stuff behind the scenes. That he, he did a very good job of unifying the party, sure. of, yeah. impro- of, of, of promoting good performance. Um, his challenge is going to be dealing with the coalition partners. Yeah. Um, I think he's got a good reign on his own party. Um, the, the question will be Peter's and Darcy Moore. Annabelle, I, I think it's ironic that the, the Prime Minister with the least political experience in history has been given the most incredibly difficult coalition yeah. combination to manage with two of the most difficult figures in New Zealand politics, quite frankly. Um, I think that if Luxon genuinely is a, a, you know, a devotee of John Key, he should go back and, you know, look more closely at how... Um, at, at um, Key's time in, in Parliament and in particular his relationship with Māori because I think, you know, if you want to have a, a long-running career as a Prime Minister, then um, then division, the politics of division, um, is not the way to achieve that. Thank you both. We've got to go. Um, two things to say, just to finish, wrap things off. One, uh, we are making in the first part of next year a podcast here at the spin-off about the events set in motion by the snap election of 1984, the fourth Labour government, all of that. If you have any insights, uh, anecdotes, contacts, reflections, thoughts, send them to me, toby at thespinoff.co.nz. I know this is the probably the best audience in New Zealand um, on that front, so I'd love to hear from you. Second thing, Samuel Robinson, this is his last pod with us, and we just want to say thanks so yes, much um, to him um, as he goes to New Pastures. Um, it's been a treat having you, Sam, and everyone who produces our podcast and goes on to incredible, incredible feats, don't they, Annabelle? They do. Like You'll probably be a, a, an Oscar nominee by the the end of next year. We love you, Sam. Tēnā koe. Ka nui te mihi ki koe. We really appreciate everything you've done for our pod and for making us sound like cool and hip and of, you know, and good voice. And we'll miss you very, very much. Go out and have a lovely summer. We'll see you next year. Get some sand between your toes. Get, get some a, get time a pack in the of ciggies. And don't get do your ciggies. That. Have a lovely nap. Figure out which one's your fave. Yummy, yummy.